And so I want to bring a message called Break the Fallow Ground. And it comes from Hosea chapter 10, verse 12. And it reads like this. Sow yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, and break up the fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. You're wondering, what time is it? Well, it's time to seek the Lord until he comes. So we seek him until he comes and rains righteousness on you. Oh, I was praying even earlier with the intercessors, saying, Lord, how we need your rain. We need your rain. This dry and barren land, we need your rain. Now, we don't understand sowing and reaping as well as those who lived in the Bible times because we don't live in an agrarian culture. We live in an Amazon prime culture. And so most of us aren't patient farmers. You know, we get impatient when it's taking over four minutes at a drive through But there's a confusing thing about the law of sowing and reaping. And it's called time. Because in between seed and harvest, there is this thing, maybe you like it, maybe you don't, called time. And so when we're sowing unrighteousness, because remember the Lord did teach us that what you sow, that you will reap. But when we are sowing unrighteousness, time is deceptive. So in between sowing and reaping, there's this thing called time. But if we sow unrighteousness, time is deceptive because we're sowing unrighteousness, but we're realizing there aren't immediate ramifications. There aren't instant consequences. And you know why? It's because the Lord is kind. And because the Lord is merciful. And something we know about the Lord is that he will give us time to repent. And that can be attributed to the patience of the Lord. How many of you know that the Lord is patient? How many of you know he's been patient with you? He's been patient with me. He's been patient with us. Because God is love and love is patient. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, there's this Jezebelic woman who's doing all kinds of evil things and polluting the church. And uh, in Revelation 2, verse 21, the Lord says that he gave her time to repent. So there was a grace period that was extended to her. So when we're sowing the wrong seeds, time is deceptive. But when we're sowing the right seeds, when we're sowing righteousness, time is discouraging. How many of you know that time could be a bit discouraging? Because it feels like the harvest is not coming. It feels like our prayers have been a waste of time. Man, I wish every time I prayed, four minutes later I get the answer. I wish it worked like Starbucks drive through where I pray and then I get exactly what I ask for. I think if that was my reality, I would be more encouraged to pray. But the truth is we can be praying and praying and praying and praying, even fasting and praying, and not see anything change. And all of us have been there. And that's why Jesus taught us a parable in Luke 18 about how when we pray, we need to pray with this patient persistence. And then Luke prefaces that parable by saying that Jesus told his disciples to make a point that they ought to pray and not give up and lose heart. To lose heart means that you got discouraged. Jesus knows that propensity to be discouraged when we are praying into something, when we're praying for something, or when we're uh, devoting ourselves to prayer. So, you know, when we're sowing in unrighteousness, how many of you would admit that you've sowed some wrong seeds before, yeah? When we sow in unrighteousness, God is patient. But when we sow in righteousness (laughs) and we're sowing in prayer, we need to be patient. We need to be patient. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if, there's a big if there, if we do not give up or if we do not lose heart. Now, what I don't like about Galatians 6 9, it says, Let us not grow weary in doing good because the next day we will reap. It doesn't say that. I wish it did. I wish at least it said the next week. Or I could wait a month. I wish it said the next month. But it says, no, in this due season, when is the due season coming? We don't really know. 
And so as we wait for this due season and we continue to sow, the Lord is testing us. And when we pass the test, we will experience um, this harvest if we do not give up. So during that time of waiting for the due season, the, the time of waiting for the harvest is a test of our patience. And it really is a test of our love because love is patient. So let me explain. The person who truly loves the Lord will love the Lord even when God is slow. <laughs> even when God is slow. I hope this isn't blasphemous, but even when he's like, you want to rename him to El Slow Die, you know, I don't know. Like, he's just being way too slow. And you're like, God, speed up. Why aren't you showing up? Why aren't you vindicating me? Why aren't you answering my prayer? And, you know, many get offended, and they fail the test and take on the attitude of Job's wife because God was slow to vindicate their family and so therefore she tells Job to curse God and die. She failed the test. But Job's attitude was very different from his wife's because, yeah, the Lord was taking his sweet time to turn things around for Job. And Job lost his dearest relationships. His body is covered in boils. But he says, naked I've come into this world and naked I will return. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. The waiting period separates the sheep from the goats. The waiting period separates those who have genuine faith and those who have fake faith. The waiting time, it separates those who love God for God and those who just love God for what God can do for them. So yeah, we're going to sow and then we need to be patient because we're waiting for that due season. We're waiting for the harvest. And meanwhile, the Lord is exposing our hearts and our motivations. But there are certain factors that will ensure a harvest. And number one, it's the quality of the soil. And then number two, it's the quantity of the rain. See, like if the soil is bad, the harvest will be stifled. And if there's no rain, we're all sowing in vain. And therefore, in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, it says, yes, sow yourselves in righteousness, sow righteousness into your life, God, and you'll reap in mercy. God wants uh, to show you mercy, but you need to sow the right seeds, and then he's going he's gonna to bless you with a harvest of his mercy uh, in your life. But then it goes on to say, break up your fallow ground. What is fallow ground? Fallow ground is ground that was once tilled, but had gone neglected. So due to neglect, it's now infested with weeds, with rocks, and with thorns. So fallow ground is ground that's been ignored. It's ground that has been undisturbed, if you will. How many of you know we need to be disturbed sometimes? But it's this ground that's gone uh, uh, way too comfortable, uh, being uh, uh, unoffended, be, be being ignored. Um, it's just been too convenient uh, for this land, and therefore it is unfruitful. And when we study what God is saying, he's saying, I need you to break the fallow ground of your heart. He's not just talking about their farms. He's talking about their hearts. Maybe once upon a time they had tender hearts, but they neglected the Lord. They started to ignore the Lord who is also their maker and their husband. And they're now in this bed of complacency and they got way too comfortable. And now... Uh, they used to be maybe once upon a time fertile soil. Now they're fallow ground. And maybe some of us here in this room, we used to be fertile soil. And now we're fallow ground. I remember the first two years when I started walking with Jesus and my heart was so tender to the Lord. Like every time I would pray and spend time with him, uh, I, I would you know, empty out a box of Kleenex. Every time I would go to church, I would put Kleenex in my pockets because my heart was so tender to the Lord for the first two years. And then I have to admit, there were times where fruitful soil or fertile soil then became fallow ground. Uh, I could relate to what the bride says in Song of Songs chapter 1, verse 6. She says, don't stare at me. I, I'm dark. And uh, because I've been darkened by the sun, because my mother's sons were angry with me, and they made me uh, take care of their vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. 
you know, what, what she's saying here is, I, I was trying to meet everybody else's expectations. I was trying to do what everybody else wanted me to do. But you know what? I neglected my own vineyard. So her vineyard became fallow ground. And sometimes we can get so busy doing this and that, trying to meet everybody's expectations that we ignore our own vineyard. And what was once fertile soil becomes this fallow ground. Now, if we have fallow ground and the rain comes, the rain will be wasted because the only thing the rain will grow are the weeds. I know we say we want revival. I know we're believing for an outpouring of God's blessing on our lives and His favor. I know we want a visitation of God's glory, but I wonder if we're ready for it. So we're asking for the rain, but is our soil prepared? Because we can be praying for the rain, Lord, pour out the rain. But he's saying, break up the fallow ground. You know, the timing of the rain is God's decision, but the tilling of the soil is my decision. It's your decision. And we can be begging God, God, pour out rain. But could it be that the Lord is begging us today, saying, break up your fallow ground. Break up the fallow ground. Prepare the soil. In James chapter 1, verse 21, it says, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God, which is able to save your souls. So here in James chapter uh, 1, verse 21, he's saying, pull out those weeds, you know, dig out the rocks, um, cast away, cast off those thorns, you know, pull out the pride, dig out the arrogance, cast away the sin so that our hearts will be marked by this meekness that when the word of God comes to our hearts, it will go to work in our lives and it will bear much fruit. And so we need to break the soil of our own hearts. We need to prepare the ground. We need to break the fallow ground so we can be a real candidate for the downpour of the Spirit. So we can be a candidate for the deluge of God's favor and blessing that he's about to release, that he wants to release upon your life and upon his church. And so that we can you know, qualify, if you will, for the showers of his power and the showers of his glory. But he's saying, would you break up the fallow ground, the word of the Lord that came through Hosea may be the word of the Lord coming to us here today saying break up the fallow ground. It's time to attend to our hearts again. It's time to bring out the plow again. It's collected spider webs and it's covered in dust. We need to pull out the plow and begin to loosen the soil again. It's not easy work. Your back may be covered in sweat. Your hands may, may, may be um, covered in blisters. But, but we, we need to take out the plow and begin to plow Again, we need to begin to plow again. You know, some people get so nitpicky. Oh, you're using the wrong brand of plow. <laughs> I don't care what brand you use. Just use it. Oh, I don't like your technique. Why do you go like this and like that? You're doing it all wrong. That's not the way I learned how to plow. I don't care your preference of plowing. We just need to plow. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And here are some people like, I don't like how they pray over there. I don't care how they pray. At least they're praying. I remember um, there was a group out here in the South Bay before my time, before I got here, and they were trying to get prayer going. And I remember I met with a pastor, and this pastor was saying, I don't think that kind of praying is going to bring revival. It's not the right brand. It's not the right technique. But at least they're praying more than you, buddy. <laughs> Do you remember a time when your heart was more tender? It's time to break up the fallow ground because it's not going to get broken on its own. It's not going to get softened on its own. The soil will not tenderize on its own. Where We need to break the fallow ground. Attention is required. Intentionality is a must. And we must be willing to labor in prayer for the breaking of the fallow grounds through contrition, through confession, 
through repentance, through restitution, through yearning, through longing, through interceding. And it's not easy work. It could, it could be arduous, you know. And that was maybe one of the reasons why we were starting to Jericho walk and getting sweaty armpits, even as we're walking around this huge room here seven times. Because a hey, prayer is, is, is not just sleeping on a bed. Sometimes it's taking out that plow and applying it to hard soil. But it's the way we prepare for the outpouring of the rain. Amen. Amen. And as we prepare the soil of our own hearts through personal prayer, we can also prepare the soil of a region through intercessory prayer. I believe that. You know, there was a pastor named Daniel Nash who traveled with Charles Finney, who was uh, you know, one of the greatest revivalists in U.S. history, but the secret to Finney's ministry was this man named Daniel Nash. You know what's really cool? We have a number of Nashes here in this church. That's a prophetic sign, man. That's a prophetic sign. I see a Nash right there. I see a Nash over there. there, there yeah, there, there's another Nash. Um, uh, yeah, there's a couple more Nashes. I mean, how many churches have you been to where there's all these Nashes? That has to be a prophetic sign. Hey, my name is Daniel, so we're like Daniel Nash, you know? <laughs> But Daniel Nash was a pastor in New York in the early 1800s. He was not a very dynamic pastor. And then he has this health crisis where he goes blind for six months. So he's confined to his room. And he's miserable. He's depressed. And yet he gets baptized with the Holy Spirit in that room. And uh, he becomes a different man. And this is how Charles Finney described Daniel Nash, he had the strongest faith and was the mightiest man in prayer that I had ever met. So for seven years, Nash and Finney partnered together. So Nash would go to every location where Finney was scheduled, and he would go even weeks in advance with his prayer partner, Abel Clary, and both Nash and Clary would get together and they would pray for weeks leading up to Finney's meeting. And when Finney would be preaching, Nash would be praying even while Finney was preaching. Finney said he never heard anyone pray like Nash. I mean, he, Nash did not pray nice prayers. He prayed violent prayers. Uh, this is how Charles Finney describes um, Daniel Nash's prayer life. He would seek a place where he could pour out his soul to God. And he, he for hours, would continue to wrestle and agonize and groan uh, and, and with his uh, crying out to God with, with all of his soul until his strength was completely exhausted and the spirit of prayer that was upon him was quite a stumbling block to the professors of religion and it will still be to this day those who do not understand uh, the spirit of grace and supplication those who do not uh, have the spirit of prayer those who don't know ab about the groanings that the Holy Spirit can produce they'll just think something's wrong with you I remember there was a time when, when I was a teenager, I would get hit with this very often, and I would just begin to travail for hours in the place of intercession, and you know, where hours go by like minutes, and I'm just covered in sweat. I no longer have a voice, and I remember when I would get into places where, where that would fall on me, and I would begin to pray, there would be a pastor that would walk up and say, Lord, would you just calm him down? He just has so many hurts in his heart. I pray that you would heal this young man from all that anger and rage that's on the inside of him. And they just don't understand the things of the Spirit. You can know the Bible, but that doesn't mean you know the Holy Spirit. And yeah, when the Holy Spirit's moving, it could be quite offensive. Well, anyway, both Finney and Nash had this understanding that intercession plows the ground so that the Word of God can come in great power, transforming even the hardest of hearts. You now, Corey Russell, he, he wrote this about Nash. He said, Finney didn't need Nash's preaching. But he said often, Finney often said, I don't need Nash to preach. I just need Nash to pray. And uh, often hidden away in a room somewhere nearby, Nash plowed in prayer, the soil of the hearts of men and women. And then Finney sowed the precious seed on that fertile soil that produced lasting fruit. Now, in those seven years, they saw about 500,000 people converted to Jesus Christ. Yeah, but it gets better because 85% of the converts stayed with the Lord. 
Yeah, and, 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 yeah and, and would be true to God and stay true to God and remain in the Lord when pretty much 70% of those who made emotional decisions under you know, other evangelistic ministries were backslidden. So sure, yeah, may, maybe somebody will boast that they let 70,000 to the Lord, but really they're pretty, the majority is all backslidden in a month. But what was the secret to this lasting fruit through Charles Finney's ministry? Well, if we sow in intercession, we can reap revival. Intercession is that righteousness, that righteous act we need to sow. And, and that mercy that we will reap, that's revival. God's mercy is a revival. Revival is God's mercy. And so somebody was breaking the fallow ground in prayer. And therefore, if you go to Daniel Nash's tombstone today in upstate New York, it reads like this. He's a co-laborer with Finney, and he's mighty. He was mighty in prayer. You know, my, my mom was part of um, Dr. David Yonggi Cho's church in Seoul, Korea. And I remember hearing Dr. Cho share on when he would preach in Korea, hearts were always so receptive. But he would travel the world, and when he would go to even some other Asian countries, he found that when he would preach the gospel, they would just be confused. And so he couldn't understand, how come when I preach in Korea, it's like, you know, revival breaks out, but when I go to that other country over there, I mean, it's not even that far away. Culture is very similar. Uh, we all come from a Buddhist background, but when I go over there, they're just confused. And he concluded it was because the Koreans had sowed prayer into their soil. And therefore, hearts were more receptive to the gospel. I mean, if you go to Korea, almost every church prays early in the morning, just about every day of the week. And, and Dr. Cho built this um, prayer mountain 30 miles north of Seoul where thousands are interceding for Korea 24-7. And, and no wonder there's fruitfulness. And no wonder, you know, the gospel um, ha has been very effective there in that country in the last, you know, 70 years. And it makes a lot of sense in light of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, where it says, If my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. When the land is healed, it's no longer fallow ground. When the, when the land is healed, it's now fertile ground. And so when the word of God comes, when the gospel is preached, there could be a major harvest. And that's why when we gather together to pray, church, we are healing the land. We're breaking the fallow ground here in our own region. I remember, uh, I think about five, six years ago, I had a friend. I hadn't spoken to him in five, six years. And out of nowhere, he never called me. Even when we went to the same church, this guy never called me. And he calls me five, six years ago. His name is Leo, and Leo Grimes. And he says, uh, Daniel, I'm here. I'm here on PCH and Crenshaw. And I sense the presence of God. And, and Leo's like this real crazy, radical intercessor, a uh, quiet guy, but he knows the Lord. And he, I know he, he's gone deep with God. And he's saying, I, I haven't been here in about, you know, six, seven years, but, but the spiritual atmosphere has shifted. Keep going. Keep going. We need to heal the land, church. That's why we are here. Yeah, not just to fill up a seat in church. We're here to be a kingdom of priests that will heal the land. A pastor in New York City named Jim Simbola of Brooklyn Tabernacle was so frustrated because his church was struggling. And he was saying, if the gospel is so powerful, God, then why is the church struggling so much? Ever wonder that yourself? If the gospel is as powerful as we say it is, how come churches are struggling as bad as we are? And the Spirit of the Lord said to Jim Simbola, if you and your wife will lead my people to pray and to call upon my name, you will never have a building large enough to contain the crowds that I will send in response. The battle for souls is a spiritual one. Did you hear me? The battle for souls is a spiritual one. It's not just a mental battle, it's a, it's a spiritual battle, and therefore spiritual weapons must be 
utilized. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Hey, you know, our, our smart business strategies, our, our clever marketing, and even appealing to people's carnal desires. Hey, we got a lot of cute singles here. You know, it, it, it may be able to build an organization or gain some attendance, but we will not see souls truly won because the battle for souls is a spiritual battle and therefore spiritual weapons must be utilized by the kingdom of priests. I like what R.A. Torrey said. He says, when the devil sees a man or woman who really believes in prayer, who knows how to pray and who really does pray, I think a lot of times we say we're going to pray for people, but we just said we're going to pray for them. We say we need to pray, oh, let's pray for America. But No, he's saying those who know how to pray and those who really do pray and above all, when the enemy sees a whole church on its face before God in prayer, he trembles as much as he ever did, for he knows that his days in that church and in that community are coming to an end. God's people, we said amen. Amen. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and rains his righteousness upon us, upon you. It's time to seek the Lord. We spend enough time sowing to our flesh. It's time to sow into the Spirit. We need to seek the Lord and break the fallow ground. We need to break the fallow ground. And I believe we can break the fallow ground in our hearts and we can break the fallow ground even in a region. I think this was about eight months ago or something like that. And I got permission to tell this story. Some of you will remember this. But it was a very unusual Sunday because... I think we were closing the service, and as I was getting ready to close the service, the Holy Spirit speaks to me saying, I'm going to fall in the back. And I said, okay, church, I'm going to the back. The Holy Spirit just spoke to me, so I'm going to go to the back. You just keep worshiping. So I get off the stage, and I walk all the way to the back, and the Lord tells me to lay hands on someone, and I lay hands on him, and then he releases this, like, shriek, that everybody could hear in the whole room. I mean, nobody loves embarrassing themselves. There was some kind of power encounter in that moment. But that was you know, Jason's second time at our church. And he said that the first time he came, he was trying to hold back the tears. He was um, in more of a backslidden state. He had been a youth pastor uh, previously, once upon a time. And then he got very um, sucked into the things of you know this world as he, he would share and he would admit and so he's feeling a bit of condemnation he hadn't really been to church for a while and he's feeling his heart melting as he's in the service and then he he fought it off the first service and then he said the next time he came it was even stronger not only was it stronger but he started feeling it even on his way to church You know, that can be attributed to the prayer of the church creating moisture in the air. You know, when there's moisture in the air, now that, that soil is, is uh, ready for an operation, if you will. Like when it's just dry soil, it's like concrete. But, you know, as we begin to pray, and we, we pray, man, you should, I was there, it, it was like the sound of many waters, and the, we, we pray. And even as we're praying, when people are even driving to church, the atmosphere is changing around them. There's moisture in the air. And sure, they may have had, you know, a heart like concrete for years, but when we begin to sow in prayer, we will reap in mercy. And, and, and when there's moisture in the atmosphere, the heart begins to tenderize and loosen. So all I did was me just being obedient to the Holy Spirit. I just went over there with a the shovel, and boom, and took out a rock, a big fat rock. And it was the rock of condemnation. And he said, that's, that's when I knew the Lord still loved me. Because he was in the back row the second time uh, he was at church saying, God, I don't have the courage to go up and ask for prayer, so... If, you, if you've not given up on me, have Pastor Daniel come back here and lay hands on me. Yeah. 
And, and now he's one of our worship leaders. And I think he's leading tonight. And he, the Lord so tenderized his heart and began to heal his other relationships because his heart was healed and being healed. Man, but well, you know, we as a church, we need to pray to make sure there's moisture in the air so the moisture will loosen up the soil so that we can take out the rocks and the weeds and we can cut out the thorns. How many of you know that we need the, God to rain his righteousness upon us? There's a righteousness deficiency in, in our lives. There's a righteousness deficiency in the church. There's a righteousness deficiency here in Los Angeles. There's a righteousness deficiency here in California. There's a righteousness deficiency in our nation. How we need the Lord to rain his righteousness on us again and afresh. Amen. 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 Yeah, and I, what I'm seeing is I'm seeing that, you know, holiness, righteousness, godliness is not something I can just conjure up or I can't just concoct it or somehow manufacture it via human effort. No, what I can do, though, is I can prepare the ground of my heart. I can sow in righteousness. I can sow in prayer. And, and I, I can prepare the ground through prayer and through intercession. But then the Lord has to come and reign his righteousness. Because if he doesn't come, if he does not come, it's all a pipe dream. We need him to come. We need the Lord to come and manifest himself to us. And that's what he's saying in Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, that he will do. He said, break up your fallow ground. It is time, sow yourselves in righteousness, or reap in mercy. Break up the fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes. Because when he comes, he's going to come and rain righteousness upon us, giving to us what we could never get for ourselves apart from him. Man, you know... There's, again, a clear righteousness deficiency. How many of you would say there's kind of a, a deficiency of holiness in my own heart, in my own life? I mean, anybody just, uh, just yeah, yeah, oh, wow, Lord, help us. <laughs> I was like, I only expected to see like three hands, but no, not everybody. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you know, us as intercessors, we need to stop blaming the church. And we need to start seeking the Lord until he comes and rains his righteousness upon us. Uh, there's a righteousness deficiency in our world, but it's time to stop blaming the world. I mean, we blame that political party. We, we blame that agenda. And we blame him. We blame her. We blame them. We blame there. But how about the church stop blaming the world? And the church starts seeking the Lord until he comes and he rains his righteousness upon the world. Amen. Amen. What happens when he comes? I have a quote from Andrew Murray. And he says, where there is much prayer, there will be much of the Spirit. Where there is much of the Spirit, there will be ever-increasing prayer. So what we see is that there's momentum in the Spirit. And that's how airplanes begin to take flight, is through Momentum. Because here's what so often happens. We have a powerful encounter with God and then we get complacent again. We experience, you know, a, an outpouring of the Spirit and then we neglect our hearts again. So it's like we're on and then off. We're, we're in and then out. It's like stop and go. It's like, you know, we, we got revived and now we're backslidden and now we need another intervention. And all we're doing is just going in a circle when really... We're supposed to go from glory to glory. From one degree of glory to another. And we're supposed to go from revival to reformation. We're supposed to go from one, one degree of Christ-likeness to another degree of Christ-likeness to another degree of Christ-likeness. One level of intimacy with God to another level of intimacy with God. Until we're walking with Enoch and we are not for God took us. Man, you know, I, I, I don't think it has to be to stop and go. This, this on and off, this... The cycle where, where, you know, the Lord blesses us. Yeah, we get the breakthrough. We get the financial breakthrough. You know, we, we, we get the breakthrough in our ministries or, or in our careers or, or some of our dreams come to pass and then we, we get complacent again and we backslide again and we neglected our hearts again and now our hearts are hard again. Now our hearts are dry again and we need another intervention again. No, I don't know if it's supposed to be that way. Even if that was the history of the Israelites, that doesn't have to be my pattern. It doesn't have to be your pattern. We can go from one degree of glory 
glory to another. Yeah, we can go from one level of glory to another. We can go beyond just a revival and we can see reformation in our world. And where there's much prayer, there will be much of the Spirit. And where there's much of the Spirit, there can be ever-increasing prayer. Where now, hey, when the Spirit comes upon us, when God manifests himself to us and he reigns righteousness on me, I am now more energized to dig again. I'm more energized to plow again. Hey, I'm not just going to plow my own field. I'm going to plow my whole city. I'm going to plow, plow, plow my whole region. I'm going to plow for my whole state. I'm going to plow for the nations. Yeah, one degree of glory to another. Let's stand together and let's pray or let's plow. Yeah, and just as a prophetic act even, take out your plow. Like I'm, I'm, I'm getting my plow. It's not going to stay in the closet anymore. God, I pray for just a revival in our hearts of urgency, of desperation. Lord, I don't want to live with a hard heart. I don't want to live with a cold, calloused heart. God, I don't want to be unfruitful any longer. God, I don't want the weeds to dominate. I don't want the thorns to cover my heart. God, I don't, I don't want the stones to, to fill up all the spaces where, where, where the seed of the Word of God is supposed to be. So, Lord, we ask that you do a work in us. Would you stir us up to break the fallow ground again? God, would you raise up a house of prayer here in the South Bay and for the South Bay? God, a people who, who will have their plows in their hand. God, raise up a people with our plowshares that we begin to plow this land, that this land will be plowed, crisscrossed, in prayer, God, I, we, we pray even next weekend, Lord, as we begin to plow together with f four or five other ministries, God, we pray for a major shift in the soil of this land, God, in the soil of people's hearts. God, let, a, let hearts who weren't open to you become more open to you. God, we're asking for this in Jesus' name. For those who pray in the Spirit, I just want to invite you to pray in the Spirit with me. Yeah, this is a different brand of plow. It's called Holy Spirit brand. Holy Spirit tongue. Oh Lord, we ask God. Even in this room, God, let somebody get a major breakthrough in their hearts today. Let big boulders come out today. God, let thorn bushes be burnt away today. Let weeds be uprooted today. Oh, let's just begin even to pray for ourselves that our hearts will be tender your hearts will be responsive oh God we contend for this fertile soil God I don't want to be embarrassed that you're coming I don't want to be put to shame when the rain falls. God, oh, yalamasho toya. I don't want the rain just to grow my weeds. Show yalabi ki alamando ki alabaso. Ti alamandi ri ki tola basa ka yalamando. Shoko yalamandi yalamando no mo. Lord, break my. I want my the fallow ground to be broken up. Oh, yalamama ka yalamando. Take out the bitterness, God. I pray for the removal of the pride, God. I, I repent of Lord, I confess and cast off. God, we come before you with contrition, Lord. I don't want to be complacent anymore.